welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought what we would do is reach out and give a celebration and recognition of Native American Heritage Month. Today, we're going to be joined by a wonderful guest who will draw from her Hopi as well as her Norwegian upbringing as she offers tales received through her heart and soul that will take you listeners on a journey to the magic of raven and bear and the healing power of earth medicine. We'll also reveal parallels between Norse mythology and Native American traditions, as well as exploring the symbology of animals and the recurring central theme of the tension between light and darkness. Sounds like quite a bit? Well, you'll actually find this to be very easy to read as you pick up the newest book, Dancing with Raven and Bear. It's a book of earth medicine and animal magic. And our guest joining us has been on the Beyond 50 radio program several times, and she's going to be joining us today, Miss Sonia Grace. Sonia, thank you for being on the program today. Hey, Dan. Good to hear your voice, and thanks for having me on. (laughs) Always exciting to have you on the program. I know you've been busy out there, media tours, traveling around the world, offering, you know, hope and healing to a lot of people going on out there. Share with our listeners what you've been up to. Well, um, I actually was a part of a wonderful series on Gaia TV called Great Minds. And so there is a show of Great Minds that is all about my work. Um, That was really fun to do. And, of course, I did Ancient Civilizations with them. And um, Lisa Gar, she had me on her new show. So I've been busy going back and forth to Boulder, Colorado. And I just got back from teaching a meditation retreat um, on the north shore of Oahu that was just beautiful and and I'm getting ready for another retreat in Bluff, Utah at the end of March of next year and you guys should come to that. <laughs> Absolutely. I know we're going to be going up to St. George in southern Utah here in about a week and a half so we're going to enjoy a good few days down there. And you know, it's really fascinating when you get out and you travel, especially out into nature and places that you've never been to before and how revitalizing it really feels to your spirit, you know, to see things and experience things that you never have before. And, you know, I seem to think, and I wanted to kind of share this with you because you've been out there doing retreats and certainly been answering a lot of questions and giving a lot of insight to people that you've been talking and working with, is that it seems that our souls this day and age are troubled and conflicted about a lot of things, especially the thing that you talk about in your book, Dancing with Raven and Bear, that of illusion. Let's talk about that to get started. Well, so a long time ago, we lived very close to the earth. You know, clear back to Atlantis and Lemuria, and certainly into this phase of humanity, which began around 10,000 B.C. And as over time, as the as the ceremonies and all of the practices shifted from goddess, uh, the focus of the goddess and high priestesses, it went to the Druids and it then shifted over to more of a male-focused practice. But both times, in both of those phases, we were close to the earth. We worshipped everything that this earth had to offer and we really connected with earth energy because we lived close to her. We were not in high rises. We were not paving roads. We were not covering her up with a lot of stuff that kind of started to separate us out from being connected to the earth. So what you just talked about is earth medicine. And when we go outside and we sit on the ground and we really connect with that energy, that's naturally what humans are meant and and able to do. And that is a huge part of our spiritual evolution is truly being able to connect with the planet. For instance, when I say discovering new things, people have heard of petrified wood. Mm -hmm. But when you visit places like southern Utah, especially Zeon National Park, you realize there are petrified sand dunes. Who ever heard of anything like that? Right. (laughs) See, when you asked me about the chapter, The Illusion, Dan, The illusion has so much to do with what we've created around us. I mean, in nature, there is illusion, meaning 
wow, did I just see something pass through the woods? You know, like you have these moments where you kind of shift into a different reality of, of awareness because there's a lot going on out in the woods or in nature. But the illusion that we have to contend with here on Earth is, is the fact that we're, we're projecting our emotional content out onto the world. And we are in transference with people as to, you know, no, that's my mother. No, I think you're my father. It's like we're constantly doing this. And so we're not really, truly tapping into what I feel is the authentic moment, this moment being what it is, because it's so layered with all of these different illusions that we're maintaining, we're believing in, and we're prescribing to. Now, what do you think happened where we started becoming confused about the illusion where rather than the ego self, for instance, as you talk about in your book, went from a place of being more of a century that protects us to a place where it becomes deceitful, you know, and sort of malicious, if you will, about uh, taking us perhaps in a direction that isn't healthy for us? Well, that's a, a great question, and, and that deserves, you know, an hour sociology talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> because if we, <laughs> if we look at how we lived tribally and how even, you know, my Hopi tribe lives today, there, there is a total understanding that you cannot create something without all of these different parts. So you have this clan and this clan and this clan and this clan all have to come together to create this, whatever it is, ceremony, this event. You can't just on your own say, I'm going to do this. It takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a village to put the, the, the components of which we are dependent upon together so that we can all live. And we've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from tribal living. We've gotten away from uh, a dependency, and I mean that in a healthy way, of each other in our family units. You know, grandma and grandpa are a part of that. We don't bring them in anymore. We send them away. We put them in homes. You know, we, we've separated and isolated over and over and over again until, to me, we've just completely blurred out what, what tribal living really is. And I, and I think that that, on a sociological level, is a part of the biggest problem that we face in our society today. Now, you uh, are from Norse as well as Hopi, uh, origin. Now let's talk about the importance of that and how you brought that together here in your book, Dancing with Raven and Bear. Well, okay, so Dan, I'm born to a Norwegian father and a mother who has Choctaw and Cherokee blood. But because I'm adopted by a family on the Hopi Reservation and I'm married to a man on the Hopi Reservation, I, I, you know, my world has been very much connected to, dialed into my Hopi culture. So, so as someone who's adopted out there and married out there, um, it, you know, there's obviously influence. <laughs> you know, we get influenced by everything sure. in our lives. But, but before all of that, I always connected with my native blood. And I've, uh, spiritually, I've always walked a red road. That's been my path through my whole life. And my Norwegian heritage, it, what's interesting is it's, it's echoed parts of that native Half, because there's so many weird similarities, particularly with Norse mythology. You know, um, for example, this is really interesting, and it doesn't necessarily pertain to Hopi. It pertains more to Lakota Sioux um, tradition. But Odin hung from the Tree of Life, Yggdrasil, for nine days. And, you know, the, the Lakota Sioux have a sun dance where the men pierce up and literally are connected to the tree. Now, that's a four-day ceremony, but Odin did it for nine. And during those nine days, he received the, the, the message or the, the gift of communication, which was the runes. And, you know, when people sun dance, they, they, they often are 
connecting in such a way that they have a vision or they receive some kind of message. And I, I, I just find the similarities so interesting between a lot of the Norse mythology and native mythology from many different tribes. Now, I was really fascinated because, you know, everybody's, uh, let's say, excited, up in arms about the series Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. which is really unique because of the, uh, you're really going back to Earth and a lot of things. There's a lot of tradition, loyalty, things like that. But I think one of the more fascinating characters for a lot of people is what is a is I guess called a skin changer in Norse myth mythology, and it's uh, the uh, character in the Game of Thrones is Bran Stark, and this was someone who was able to see through and guide animals. Mm -hmm. Now let's and go ahead and talk and to about to some that. extent shape shift, right? Right to mm -hmm. to an extent, but he was actually staying in his own body, just kind of consciously going into an animal, mm -hmm. you know, whether mm -hmm. it be let's say a raven or a bear or a wolf, things like that and being able to see what's going on through that animal. Correct. Well, in my book, Dancing with Raven and Bear, there's a lot of shape-shifting, and there's a lot of... I, want, I really wanted to give people an experience. I wanted people to read these stories and have an experience, because I, I did when I wrote them. <laughs> I was completely altered when I wrote these stories, meaning creator was, you know, coming through me and, and guiding me as I wrote these stories. And so for me, even to this day, when I read these stories, I cry. I mean, I can't believe it. I'm like reading these stories going, wow, this is still making me cry. Because it's, it, because it's such a deep truth for me, for me, as the writer, as the person who, you know, brought this information in. And I wanted people to think outside of the box. I wanted them to have this, wow, I think reality is this, but when I shift just a little bit, look, it, it looks like this. And thus the experience of, you know, the woman suddenly sputtering feathers out of her mouth and squawking, and, and she turns into a raven. And it ends up being her true form. She actually was a raven all along, but she had to go through some things as a human to learn what she needed to learn so that she could then return to her natural state. We don't think like that in, this, in our world today. We don't think about, you know, maybe being something else. We just get stuck on, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a nurse, I'm a, you know, construction worker, I make coffee at Starbucks. Whatever it is, we get stuck in those badges that we wear, and we don't often allow ourselves to think beyond that. Now, I think it's really important to note, too, that uh, shape-shifting, uh, I know uh, sometimes a common question is, is physiologically, for instance, in Native American culture, does a person actually shift from being a human, let's say, into a deer, something like that? Yes, yes. And there, is, there are people who can do that and actually take the form of that animal. I've known people, and this is more on the darker side of shape-shifting, but I, I've known medicine people who, who shifted into a, an animal form and the animal was hit on the highway and that person was dead the next morning. So it, it happens. And, and there's a lot of stuff around that. Different tribes have different, you know, sort of stories and belief systems around shape-shifting. And I, for me, I view it and I see it as something that perhaps is more a, a metaphor in my book. It's more of a metaphor that, you know, she turned back into a bear or the bear turned into a human. It's the metaphor of that change and that shift in consciousness. Now, uh, in your book, uh, for people who will become interested in reading this, is I realize that you actually have it set up where you don't go from chapter to chapter as though it's a continuous mm -hmm. dialogue or story, but you can actually choose particular things that you might feel, you know, this is something that I'm feeling relevant today or at this moment in my life. How did you go about becoming, uh, I guess, inspired and, uh, for lack of a better word, channeling this from yourself into the pages that you wrote? Well, a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, as a healer, day in and day out, 
morning till late at night. I'm I'm working with people on the phone, long distance, doing you know healing work as an energy surgeon, you know, addressing the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual bodies. And in that process of doing healing work, on you know people all over the world, I I I run into their resistance, like they're holding on to a story, something that happened to them in 1984, and they can't let it go. You know, that's a resistance. And so I'm always working to get through and get past and help them lift that off so they don't have to carry that with them anymore. And I thought about these stories, and my original artwork is all through this book and very much an inspiration for me writing these stories. I thought about that, and I thought, you know, a really good way to get through to people is through storytelling because, A, it engages their inner child, and, B, they're hearing it from a different place or they're reading it and they're not engaged in, you know, a, a, a processing session. And, and it's, it's been beautiful on that level because I did write stories about love and power and dreaming and death and the illusion and, you know, all these different topics that we deal with day in and day out, but they're, they're through these magical stories and they give you a whole different way of sort of digesting that. I mean, the, the chapter on death, um, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Kiran O'Mahony, who's a, he's got a Ph.D. in uh, early childhood psychology, he said that chapter should be mandatory for all parents and all children because of the message that it gives about death and that death is nothing more than a transition. And it, it is. It's a lovely story that really takes the, the fear out of what that, you know, go behind the veil, change your clothes, come back dressed as somebody else. You know, it's like it takes that, that edge off. You know, uh, and it's uh, when we were talking earlier, for instance, about getting back to the woods, if you will, back yeah. to nature. Uh, one of the things I remember one time I was talking with someone, and I had actually said, do you think of the earth as a living, intelligent being? I didn't say thing, I said being, because, I mean, when you think about the balance the earth has and the life that it actually supports, you can't help but being, you know, just phenomenally awestruck that, uh, you know, this isn't just a giant rock that just happens to have great equilibrium. <laughs> you know, there's got to be a lot more to that. Do you think of the earth as a spiritual being? And do, you know, ancient traditions that say Norse or Native American, do they feel that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And yes, I do. I, in fact, I call her the goddess. I have seen her. Her spirit is enormous. And she inhabits this earth, her body, just like your spirit inhabits your body and my spirit inhabits my body. It is her body. It's shaped different, it's, but it's got all the same systems. There's chakras on her body. She has lots of water like we do. She has blood, oil, flowing through her veins. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's, just, it's compiled and put together different. And, of course, she's a much higher consciousness than we little humans are. She's, she's benevolent. You know, all of these planets have spirits inside of them. Everything has spirit. And that's what my native culture has really brought into this book, is acknowledging that the fire, the water, the air, the earth, the, 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 all the elements have spirit. Everything, the plants, the trees, all of it. You know, I thought about that because I remember it was some time ago I was watching a uh, series documentary on the Galapagos Islands. And what was actually discovered, this was uh, many years after Darwin, is that this was literally an area that continuously recreated, recreated itself, A, and B, even the species would recreate themselves as a result of this recreation. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. I found that really fascinating, that when you think about the Earth as a whole, for instance, how volcanoes rise and they create islands, and how islands will sometimes break up and they'll disappear, and this constant changing of things. And, you know, it, it just seems a shame when you begin to hear 
and know of things like large floating plastic islands in the middle of the ocean, you know, and the things right. that we've sort of arrogantly dismissed as, well, that's okay. If we don't see it, it couldn't be harmful sort of a thing. Right. Well, there there is sort of this, um, to me, there's different stages of amnesia that humans have. We have the amnesia that we're born with. Oh, gee, I don't remember any past lives. You know, I, I, I don't know. And then we have the amnesia of, you know, I'm only willing to deal with this, but I'm not willing to deal with this. And, that, you know, so there's these, you can call it denial, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I, I'm also a firm believer that, again, going back to our sociology class, um, we, we are a society, or if not a world, that is really, really addicted. And we are addicted so massively across the board from alcohol to drugs to gaming to phones to Internet to, you know, food, everything. We have so many addictions that we've kind of built a structure, if you will, a template in how we deal with things very much like an addict. And it's, um, it's fascinating to me because I think that the further we get away from living close to the earth and really accessing that earth medicine, then the easier it is for people to go off in these different uh, forms of addiction. And, you know, you're so right because I know that when people really pursue what enlivens their spirit, you don't want addiction because although addiction, I remember I had a guest many years ago on a program that I was uh, producing says, uh, you know, that these things will throw you immediately into the castle, so to speak. Yeah, and I love yeah. this analogy. But then they also throw you right back out just as fast. That's right. Whereas pursuing things, for instance, that enliven and electrify your soul. And, 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 and to give people an idea, they go, okay, well, this sounds like some of that hokey 12-step stuff. Oh, no, no, let's go ahead and take a look at this. <clears throat> try pursuing something that you've never done before, something that you've actually felt intimidated by. Let's say it could be programming code on a computer for something simple like a, a simple little video game. Mm -hmm. You've never done this before. And you get in there and you realize as you're tearing your hair out, man, I can't do this. And there's that moment the brain's telling you, you're right, you can't do this. I don't want to do this because this is a brand new thing. And Think about everything it took for me to be on automatic to get everything else in your body working. Do you want to go and add this to me, too? Come on. Let's go back to the way things were. Right. You push right. through that, though, mm -hmm. and then finally you realize, wow, I did it. And that moment of excitement when you finally break through and actually learn that brand new thing never, ever, ever goes away. Right. You That's know, right. And then you decide to pursue mastery. That's a whole different thing altogether. You can see that the residue from that experience is a continuous, lifelong high with no downward spin. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And to, to add a little neuroscience to what you're saying, when we're in addiction, when we come from dysfunction, we tend to hang out in the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that is the the fight or flight and a lot of kids are in the amygdala and they come from, from home from school and they have a d or an f on their paper and their parents are like what's wrong with you how come you can't learn anything and you know they have no idea or they're not dealing with the fact that their child is in fear most of the time or in that fight or flight mode and the amygdala tends to be more like the train station which okay i'm going to stay here but which part of the brain am i going to go into and what we want to have happen is we want the 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 back of the brain to open up with these pathways with white matter that goes to the prefrontal cortex and when we're in the prefrontal cortex that's when we're learning that's when we're keeping our memory that's when we're really like everything's firing and so there's all kinds of reasons why we get into these, these, these spaces where, like you were saying, try something new. And if we understand where, what part of our brain we're in and wh why we're doing what we're doing, it helps us even more. And, and again, this, this is, I mean, I think this is really powerful stuff, you know, and for your listeners, even to just challenge yourself with, okay, I've been walking, you know, a half a mile every day, I'm going to up it to a mile. Just that kind of accomplishment is noteworthy and important. 
Now, what we haven't talked about for is the title of your book and the uh, two central characters that you uh, have here, uh, I guess, teaching the lessons, or at least as part of the stories. That is the raven and the bear. Now, let's talk about why those two central characters there. Well, when I was growing up, Dan, I was as much an artist as I was a dancer. And I drew ravens and bears all through my childhood. I felt very connected to these two animals. And subsequently, they became the characters of my stories. Raven, of course, in a lot of different native cultures, is viewed as the trickster, as someone who's going to teach you, but maybe a bit like, you know, the trickster teaches us, like, oh, I thought it was this, but then poof, it's really that. Whereas the bear in my stories, he's, he's a medicine man, and he's the one that is doctoring and healing all of the different animals in the woods and, you know, helps a few humans along the way. So they work together. They're very much a team, and they offer sort of a different perspective of teaching throughout the book. And then, of course, there's other characters that come into the stories and inter- interact with them. You know, there's the young girl or the woman or the, you know, the, the deer, the, the badger. I mean, there's lots of different characters. But these two characters are near and dear to my Hopi and Norwegian heart. <laughs> Now, I, I really like that because uh, it's funny how often I'll hear people talk about crows and ravens in a negative sense, and that's mainly because that's how they're depicted, especially in movies, thrillers, things like that. But I think, so have you ever really paid attention to these two birds? I mean, they're really phenomenally intelligent, and, and I can think of a lot of people that they're a lot smarter than. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the raven, for instance, because I know that, for instance, in England, they're held to royalty. That's yeah. something you just don't mess with, you know. Right. I mean, they're, they even have their own area of the castle. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do, and th- and they're very important. And, you know, we actually see the raven a lot in um, Game of Thrones. Um, I think historically the raven has a really prominent sort of um, position, and certainly in Norse mythology you have Hugin and Munin who were thought – and uh, vision that, that, that were Odin's um, two ravens that sat on his shoulders, and they were the ones that went into the nine realms and told him what was going on, what they saw, what they heard. They, they, they were, Hugin and Munin are really big in Norse mythology, and what's interesting is how much of that Norse mythology spilled into other um, cultures and other storylines you know there's a goddess Idun who is the keeper of the apples and she has these sacred apples that were given to her by a giant and apparently the Norse gods are dependent upon these apples and eating them or they start to age which implies there's some level of mortality there and she the the goddess is sort of the keeper of the elixir, the magic that keeps the gods going. I find that fascinating because we have stories like Little Red Riding Hood and Sleeping Beauty and, you know, and, and, and Adam and Eve and the apple. I mean, there's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, you know, I know that the listeners out there will find this to be a wonderful book in its simplicity, but its uh, depth is certainly something they'll be able to meditate uh, quite deeply on here. What would you say was the particular chapter that really brought a lot out in you, that really had, I guess, the most meaning? And I know they all did, but what would you say that would be? Well, my favorite chapter, and it changes daily, but today... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my favorite so. chapter is holding the darkness at bay and i was going to ask you can i read like just a paragraph of it sure so absolutely listeners could hear kind of the flavor of the stories um, creator came to bear one day and gave him a drum he told bear that he must sing his songs where there is darkness he cannot escape bear took this very seriously and practiced every day 
The earth heard him singing and taught him songs for the water and the rain. He would go to the river and sing to the water, his tears running down his face. His love ran deep for the earth. One day Bear noticed a darkness coming towards him. This cloud grew bigger and bigger and Bear started to sing. He sang his songs and beat his drum so loud he was sure Creator would hear him. He called out to Creator but did not get an answer. He worried Creator could not see him or hear him because the darkness was becoming so strong. The earth's energy came up through his feet and Bear suddenly felt grounded and not afraid. He heard the goddess whisper, you must use your light with each song. Bear was confused. What is my light and how can I find anything with such darkness around me? He asked himself. So I won't finish the chapter so your readers or your listeners can read the story themselves, but I love this story because it's a concept that we all deal with daily and that is, oh my God, there's so much darkness and there's so much evil and there's so much this and so much that. And it's a beautiful way of really looking at how we can deal with the darkness and that it truly is our inner light that blasts through everything that love in our heart is is the light that guides each one of us and it's a really nice story that that reminds us of that now sonia you know i want to know and this is something that you wrote in your book when the hearts and minds of people are not aligned, then they will often bring nothing but wind. (laughs) Well, we've certainly felt that breeze for several years now. (laughs) All right. I mean, that's an obvious statement here, but, you know, it's something I I had to bring up here as we wrap up the show. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it speaks very clearly. Yeah, but for some people it won't. They'll have to probably get on and Google that on one of their little smartphones. Well, we we have to align our heart and our mind, meaning, okay, here's a really good example. Let's say I have in my mind, I want a BMW. I want a really good car. I want a BMW. But in my heart, my heart is saying, well, I don't really deserve that, you know, and I don't have the money to buy that and pish posh and all kinds of, you know, oh, it's not going to happen because somewhere in my heart I'm not believing or feeling I deserve that. In my mind, I want it. Okay, so those two things are not aligned. Those are two different energies coming out of me. So in order for us to align the mind and the heart, we have to do the inner work. We have to go in and figure out, process call me for an appointment, like where, where is this stored in my body and what is the emotional wound from childhood that's holding me back from believing I deserve to have something that will make my life better and you know, certainly get to work easier, blah, blah, blah. And where is it in my mind that my ego believes you know, that, that I should have this but my ego is also protecting this emotional wound and not allowing my mind and heart to align. So it's complicated, but it's really important in, if I have any final closing statement here to say it's an inside job, and we all have the responsibility now to go within and to do the emotional work, and this book is a big help on that. Absolutely. Well, Sonia, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Where can people find out about your work, where you're at, how they can pick up the book, things like that? Sure. Um, my website, Sonia, S-O-N-J-A, Grace, G-R-A-C-E, dot com. You can find everything you need on there, appointments, the book, retreats, everything. Very good. Sonia, thank you for being on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Dan. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for joining us. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. (laughs) 